All right, here we go. We have the artist formerly known as Napoleon uh, of the Outlaws, who we've interviewed uh, a few times before, uh, here to join us, actually live from Saudi Arabia. Yes, yes. What's up, Vlad? It's a pleasure to be back on your show, bro. Of course, man. We go back. For sure, for sure. <laughs> and you looking yeah. young and young and every time I see you, bro. Thank you. Healthy living. That's good. Keep it up. Keep it up, bro. Keep it up. Yeah, you look great as well. Thanks, man. Thanks. Uh, well, number one, how is Saudi Arabia dealing with coronavirus and, and the pandemic that's happening worldwide? Well, Saudi, they actually um, was one of the first countries that stopped international and domestic traveling, domestic flights, um, domestic traveling from city to the, to the next city. So they did a great job. You know what I mean? Anything to do with the COVID-19, the government, you know, took care of it. So, you know, they, they didn't differentiate between a citizen or a non-citizen, even illegals. You know, there was people here in Saudi Arabia who was illegal. And the king said, you know, we still going to cover any medical fees that they have. You know what I mean? So they did an amazing job, definitely. That's dope, man. That's great to see someone doing a better job in the U.S. right now. <laughs> yeah, bro. I don't think too many. It's, it's, it's. I don't think America got too many countries beat with this, unfortunately. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's sad. Yeah, though. We're the worst right now. We're we're the we're the absolute worst when it comes to to the virus spreading. Yeah. Uh, so, how long have you been living in Saudi Arabia now? I've been in Saudi Arabia for ten years. For ten years, buddy. But every every summer I'm back in LA, you know, so, you know, I balance it out. You know, I I come here, I stay the winter days, and then for the summers, I I try to escape the heat. I go to LA, which of course is much cooler, but you know what I mean? I enjoy it. But this summer, of course, because of the virus, I'm I'm stuck in Saudi, but I'm thankful. (laughs) Well, I'm glad that you and your family are safe right now. That's the most important thing. Thank you, bro. Same to you. Same to you. Well, I want to get back into your whole story again. So in one of our interviews, we went through the really tragic story about how some men came into your house and killed both of your parents. Yes. So I want to pick up from that moment and in terms of what happened to your life after that, because now here you are with your brothers. Uh, you have a sister also, right? No, nah, just brothers. No sister. Brothers. So, yes. Okay, sorry about that. So here you are with your brothers and you guys are without without parents. Yeah. So what happened to the family, to you and your siblings after that? So after the death of my parents, me and my brothers, man, we was blessed enough to have um, my grandparents on both sides, you know, ready to take us in. But we moved with my um, my father's parents in Irvington, New Jersey. And, um, you know, they did the best, you know, according to their ability of what they had to raise me and my brothers and my cousins. You know what I mean? But eventually we got caught up in the streets. You know what I mean? So my grandmother, I grew up in a house where it was um, not only just my brothers, but it was other relatives. It was cousins. It was aunties. It was uncles. My grandmother didn't turn no one, turn no one around. You know what I mean? Away. You know what I mean? So we had so many people living with us, which I enjoyed it growing up. And um, I'm thankful to have, you know, grandparents the way, you know, they took care of us the way they did. You know, I'm thankful for that. Definitely. Okay, but you started getting caught up in the streets, and at one point, you started selling crack. Yes, yes, yes. You know, I started, my brothers and my cousins, they started before me. And um, so, you know, they was outside on the block and at early ages. When I was like, when I was 13 years old, the first time that I saw, tried to sell drugs, I got arrested. You know what I mean? I don't think I last selling cocaine or crack for more than maybe six months. You know what I mean? So... I was on a block one day, I pro- no, no older than 14 years old. I would say 13 to be exact. So I was on a block one day and you know, back then we used to sell crack vials, you know, the cocaine and the, the vials. So the police came, they pulled up and I tried to run into the store and I took, you know, I took the drugs from out of, my, out of my pocket and I threw it into the refrigerator or the freezer with the ice cream and stuff that they had in the, the, the corner store. And I walked back outside and I was arrogant because I felt like I just outsmarted the police. So they see me running to the store, so they knew I was up to something, you know what I mean? So they pushed me, they start checking me, and I didn't know that one of the crack valves slipped into my pocket. So they arrested me, you know what I mean? But I was so young, like I said, I was only 13 years old. You know, they took me to the station, smacked me up a couple times, called my grandmother, and took me home. But from that day then, I was like, you know what? 
I'm gonna try to figure something else out to get up out of the hood. I want to do something different. And that's when I started writing poetry, starting writing writing raps. You know. Well, along with getting in the streets, you actually got kicked out of school. You were considered one of the worst students in that school, right? Yes, that's high school. In high school, you know, we got a new principal that came in, and um, before her, we had a principal. He was man, this dude was cool. He was Italian. You know what I mean? I forget his name, but he was like. He was too cool to the point that if the students want to lie and say we we came from his office, he would take up for us. <laughs> you know what I mean? But he was he was a, he was a cool dude, and um, eventually they got rid of him, and they bring in, they brought in a principal African American lady who was tough, and she called me to her office and she was like, "Man, I asked for the the names of the worst kids, the first, the top ten or top twenty or maybe a hundred or whatever um, kids in the school, and your name was at the top 10. And she was like, if you mess up one more time, we're kicking you out. I didn't take her serious. You know what I mean? I thought she was like the, the prior principal. You know, we can do whatever we want. I joked around, did some, you know, made some more mistakes and she kicked me out. But at that same time that she kicked me out of school, I already knew Pac. So I had to make a decision to go to night school or try to pursue my career in the music industry. Okay. And you knew Pac through Gaddafi? Through Gaddafi, yes, yes. Yes. Okay. And from what I understand, because there, there's a bunch of outlaws, there's a bunch of guys from Thug Life and so forth, but Pac and Gaddafi were the closest in terms of relationship. Yes, yes, for sure, agree. But it's all it was it was um also Edie, also Castro. When I came around, you know, Pac Click was, of course, he had the Thug Life, you know, Moprim, Rated R, Big Psych, Macadocious. He had the Thug Life Click. But the outlaws, they before it was the outlaws, they was young thugs. You know what I mean? So when I came around, it was young thugs, and it was only Gaddafi. He was known as Hollywood. Um, Castro was known as K-Dog, and Edie was known as Big Mouth. It was them three. You know what I mean? And that was their crew. So when I came around, it was before the outlaws. They still was young thugs. And then Pac caught, you know, when he put me in a group, he decided to name us Drama Cidal. And then eventually, we went to Outlaw Immortals or Outlaws for short. Yeah, it's kind of ironic, you know, in 2020 where you have one of the big hip hop artists named Young Thug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, who's who's compared himself to Tupac before? Oh yeah, I ain't even know that man. <laughs> oh yeah, no, he he. Well, he compared himself to Tupac, and then uh, this other uh, rapper from from Atlanta named YFN Lucci, who was I guess beefing with him at the time. He said uh, Tupac didn't wear a dress. Called himself New Pac, and you said Tupac didn't wear a dress. Shit, I don't know who I would talk to. <laughs> You don't know nothing about that. Okay. Uh, Tupac didn't wear a dress, though. Big up, big Tupac up. didn't wear a dress. Trust me, I've done more Tupac-related interviews than anybody. <laughs> Tupac did not wear a dress. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> True, bro. <laughs> right. Yeah, so you guys were called the Young Thugs. Yeah, so we was the Young Thugs, man. And um, we did a few songs as the Young Thugs, and then eventually... Pac decided to call call us drama cider. It was like a Bay Area slang that they used to put back then on on words. They would always add the word cider on it. Like, you know, he's drama cider, he's crazy cider. It was just a Bay Area slang, you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh I guess the first time you met Pac and you told him the story about how your parents got killed, Pac was actually crying. Yeah, he was crying. And it shocked me, you know what I mean? Because um at that part of Pac life, at that particular time, he was very controversial. He was always in and out of the, the media, the newspaper, always on television. He was a controversial individual, you know what I mean? So always getting arrested. So, you know, when I went to the hotel room, and I mentioned this in my book in details, but when I went into the hotel, I went there with the, the mindset that I have to prove to Pac how much of a street dude because I was really on the streets, Vlad. Like I was on the streets every single day around hustlers, around killers. I grew up in that environment. So I said to myself, man, I'm I'm gonna impress Pac with, you know, where I come from. And Pac shut that down though. You know what I mean? He he wasn't really he, he shut that down. He didn't want to hear that type of talk. He wasn't he he was like, man, that, that's gonna waste my time. You know what I mean? So he was like, but I wanna know what happened to your mother and father because Yasmin, which is the mother of Gaddafi, who introduced me to him, you know, she must have told him the story, the story um briefly, you know what I mean? So after I was telling him the story, man, during during me telling him the story, I look up and I seen tears coming down his eyes. And I was shocked because, you know, the television, they 
you know, put this image out of Pac, like this macho man and always in trouble. And I was able to see another side of him from that that day. You know what I mean? And he and that's the side that I knew him until he passed away. He had that sensitive side with him, you know, that he cared, he cared for the people deeply, you know? Oh yeah, no, Tupac was really sensitive from definitely. everything that I've seen. Definitely, definitely. You know what I mean? I just interviewed Richie Rich uh, a few days ago. Richie and, Rich, uh, OG. He told me that that he knew Pac early on. He actually used to come by and sell weed to like Pac and, and the outlaws and stuff like that. I serve him the weed and get his number, give me my number, bloom, and I pull up out of there. And we kind of just start hanging from there. But he was more into the, the he was on the black power kick that time. It was, this wasn't death row Tupac. Did you ever run into him early on? Of course, Richie Rich, yeah, because um, when I first met Richie Rich was, um, um, what's my man name from Digital Underground, Humpty Hump. Um, what's his name? Shock hey, G. Shock G. Shock G had a wedding, he, you know, so Pop flew us all out there to Oakland and Richie Rich was there. You know, all his homies from the Bay Area was there, but I knew Richie Rich from, I knew Pac always speaking about people like Richie Rich, E-40, the governor. So I already, I always heard about these names when I first met Pac. So when I met Richie Rich, him and Pac was very close. You know what I mean? They had a, a real close relationship, a dope relationship. And he's a legend, Richie Rich. Oh yeah, no, and he was kind of explaining how when he first met Pac, Pac was the black power rapper. Yeah. He, he had like the... You know, like the Nefertiti necklace. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, he didn't wear any gold, no Rolex, no nothing. You know, that's when his first album came out. Yes, yes, yes. And he was really like Black Panther, Black Power, and so forth. And slow, and Richie Rich was like, well, we're on some gangster shit over here. So, <laughs> yeah. You know, but he said that over time, Pac started to, to kind of change and kind of get more gangster in his lyrics. Yeah, I, I I think you can say that because Pac evolved with what he went through in life, you know what I mean? And I'm sure Richie Rich and him will agree with that, that, you know, Pac, like like everybody, like anybody that got caught up to, got caught up with a gangster lifestyle and got more aggressive, it's because of the environment, you know, put him in that situation, made him start behaving in this, you know, situation or with that attitude or that mindset. So the same with Pac, you know what I mean? Because you know, like what is what's my man name? He was he was he was in Pac Group. He was Pac rap partner. Um, Ray Love, uh, Ray Love. So Ray Love Ray and Pac Love. was in the group together, and 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 Ray Love was like when he first met Pac. Pac and Pac was hustling. You know what I mean? Even though he was around gangsters, he was around killers, and they was in Oakland, and Pac was selling drugs. And when the lady came to buy drugs off of Pac, and she was pregnant, Pac said he would never do it again. So he always had that. You know what I mean? That side of him. You know what I mean? So, so when people try to say like, like as if he just became a gangster, no. Pac always had that military Black Panther uh, mindset because of the way he was raised, but he also had that street gangster with him. Like he was on the block. You know, I think everybody got somebody in the neighborhood that's like that. Like he can be streeting on the block with us, but he more conscious than the rest of us. And Pac was that type of person. You know what I mean? Well, at one point, Pac was uh, on set uh, doing the movie Gang Related. Yes. And I guess there was a situation with Jim Belushi that happened. <laughs> yeah, Jim Belushi. I think uh, he bit Young Noble Hamburger, <laughs> and um, and Pac was up. Like Pac wanted Noble to check him. You know what I mean? But we was kids because we didn't know we would have messed it up for Pac. So no, Young Noble probably was like he told Pac like I don't know if I would have, you know, reacted. And because he Pac felt like um, Belushi was like saying slick stuff. You know what I mean? Through the whole set, and it was kind of rubbing Pac the wrong way. So Pac ain't really like that. When he came into the the, the trailer and just looked at Young Noble Hamburg and bit it and put it down, Pac didn't ain't really like that. Like he too comfortable and to, to a degree it was kind of disrespectful. You know what I mean? So he told Noble, you should have stood up. But Noble, like, man, I don't, you would have kicked it. We, you probably would have got kicked off the movie set. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, because remember, uh, Pac ended up getting into it with the Hughes brothers over Menace to Society and ended up just saying, this movie and just walked out. True, true, true. Because he ain't really want to. It, it really all became because they wanted Pac to. They wanted Pac to play the role of a so-called Muslim gangster. And Pac was like, you know, Pac got a lot of Muslim family members, cousins, his big cousins, um, his aunties, and stuff like that. So he come from a family of Christians and Muslims like myself. You know what I mean? And Pac had some cousins that grew up Muslim, was born Muslim, like his cousin Yusef and them, and Bill, Bill Bang, which is Castro brother. 
he became Muslim. Kenny also became Muslim. So Pot saying that what Islam done for his family, uh, in the most, you know, in the most, in, in the most sense, it, it, it made most of them positive people. You know what I mean? The ones who really practice it. So he probably felt like that's betrayal, like for me to play a so-called Muslim gangster. So he got, you know, Pac was a hothead. <laughs> well, the situation happened in New York. Yes. With Ayanna Jackson. Yes. Where Pac was ultimately uh, convicted of some form of sexual assault in that situation. Yes. Now, for the longest time, Ayanna Jackson never spoke. But since our last interview, you know, the interview you and I did, I did a full interview with Ayanna. Yes. Did you watch this interview? I, 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 seen, I seen that interview. That was a few years back, right? It was. Yes, I seen the interview. It was. Yes. Based on what you know, you know, being with Pac and talking to him about that situation. Yes. And what she said on camera, what was your uh, feedback on it? Knowing Pac, man, and, um, you know, he was raised in a house full of women. And his respect that he had for women like his mother, his aunt, his sisters. I know Pac, he would never disrespect a woman, woman in that manner. You know what I mean? Like he would never do something against a woman will. And that's, we know that. From what, it, from what I recall is that, you know, it was dudes in the hotel at that particular time. You know, Pac was in another room. She was in another room. And um, you, of course, I can't really go into detail because of my religion, you know what I mean? So I have to try to, you know, not just openly speak about this thing. But from what happened, when Pac was in a room and he fell asleep, his homies or his the guys who he thought was his homies was in the other room taking advantage of her. You know what I mean? And Pac, he wouldn't agree with that if he would have woke up and he would have seen that situation happening. Pac would have stood up for that, for Ayana. No doubt, because Pac, that's the type of personality, that's the type of personality he had. He would have never been down with something like that. You know what I mean? So that's why he was more upset that why blame me for something that I have nothing to do with? You know what I mean? Just because these dudes disrespected him. But that comes with the territory. I guess they look at it like, well, it was your hotel room. You invited her. But still, he was innocent, hands down. You know what I mean? Well, even though we never got to speak to him on camera, I did have conversations with Charles Fuller, you know, a.k.a. Man Man. Man wow. Who was, who was the co-defendant in that yeah, case. Yeah, I wonder how, how, how he doing. He's cool. He's cool. He's working, I believe, in Oakland. You know, he went on with his life. Definitely. And he watched the whole interview, and me and him talked about it. And he said, you know, there were a few things that were different, but more or less the story he told, she told was more or less what happened. Mm. Now- the way he described it was Pac was in the room with a girl. He walked out and the other guys walked in. Exactly. Okay. But, you know, you look at this through a 2020 lens and you say, okay, I invited this girl to my hotel room, you know, because me and her have been having, you know, relations. Mm -hmm. And I left and let these other guys go in and do whatever you know, Pac didn't play a role in terms of shielding her and protecting her and so forth, which he could have done, you know. And the other thing about it was that, and I remember I talked to Charles about this specifically. Yes. When when Pac woke, when she woke him up and she was like screaming and everything, oh, like, you know, they did all this stuff to me. Pac's first reaction was, get this bitch out of my face. Wow. Who said that, Charles or she? Man Man said this? Or this both is said it. Okay. They both said, and I remember I said, I said, I said, Charles, if at the time that this girl got hysterical and Pac, instead of his reaction, try to calm her down and say, Hey, listen, I'm sorry. Let's go. Let's go hang out. Let's, let's just get up out of here. Let me calm you down. Would none of this have happened? Would she have not gone to the police? And he said, absolutely. Well, you got to understand, man, 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 and Pac fell out. And I, I'm not in, in, who you or was Man Man saying that he was standing next to Pac bed when this lady came and she's that's kind of like, you know what I mean? It seemed like she ran into Pac room because I heard her, her interview and I heard Pac mention that she ran into Pac room and woke him up. But I don't think Man Man and them followed her into Pac room. You know what I mean? It's he say she say at the end of the day, man. 
you know, the lady know what happened. Of course, God knows. The lady knows what happened. Pot knows what happened. And I think even Pot said that he wished he was he would have been able to protect her. He mentioned that. You know what I mean? He admitted that right. that his only mistake was that he wasn't able to stop whatever was about to happen to happen. You know what I mean? Hap from happening. You know what I mean? So he admitted that, but they arrested him as if he was a perpetrator within that that crime. You know what I mean? So that's why he was upset, and that's unjust the way they did him. Yeah, and and I think that during that time, and you know, men men oftentimes mature, but sure. you know, Pac had songs of you know, wonder why they call you, bitch. Yeah. and he had he had songs you know, like All About You, yeah. which which are misogynistic songs. Yeah, but he came out with these songs after he got lied on about raping a woman. Like if you look at Pac, his he did, he wasn't doing these type of songs attacking women before that. You know what I mean? He was doing Keep Your Head Up, Dear Mamas. And then when he got, you know, went to prison for something that he didn't do, he got angry. He started, even his lyrics and everything started changing. You know what I mean? And he said it. Pot said, man, he said, man, what changed me is that I used to do songs for women, especially women of color. And then a woman of color accused me of doing something, exploiting her sexually in a way that I never done it. And I got sent to prison for this. And I used to do songs for the people in the neighborhood, for our community. And then people from my community who looked like me shot me. And that's when you start, you know, that's when pop music started changing. When he went through them two incidents, when he got shot in New York and when that girl lied and said he raped her, that's when everything changed for Pac. His personality, his he became more angry. You know what I mean? It, it, he changed his music, his personality, everything. Yeah, and that was actually going to be my next question is that after the shooting... You know, it's sort of everything that he felt he had done for black people and how he never felt like a black woman would accuse him of anything. He never felt like a black person would, would shoot him. But both both things happen, both of them from black people. And it seemed like it kind of messed him up. It messed him up. It happened within um, the same, you know, time period, the same time frame. So back to back, you know what I mean? And that's when he started changing. And he, he said it. You know what I mean? He said it. Like, and if you look at his history and you look at even from his lyrics, people can actually see when he started to change. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I guess after the the quad shooting, he was kind of hiding out at Jasmine Guy's house. Yes, yes, yes. Jasmine Guy took, you know, she looked out for him. Was that someone that he was having a relationship with or just a platonic friend? I think they were just friends, you know what I mean? Platonic friends. I think she had a lot of respect. She was close friends with his moms as well, with Jada Pinkett. They was all, to, they was all, you know, they known each other for years, and um, Pot trusted her, and um, you know, she wasn't involved in no street activities at all. So he knew that coming to her house would be a safe place. She pretty much looked out for him. Uh, did you see Jada Pinkett around? At that particular time, no. In general, I seen her like you know when he was in the hospital in Vegas. When we, I believe, also. You know, when they had the memorial for him, she was around. She came around, but I haven't she I haven't seen her during the death row days or nothing like that, you know? Okay. Now he gets convicted of the sexual assault situation. Yeah. And now he goes to prison. And you're actually going out and visiting him in prison. Yes, yes. Myself, the outlaws. Actually, when he went to prison, myself, Edie, Castro, Gaddafi, we all went back to Jersey. Me, Castro. Um, Edie, Doughboy, D-Boy, I mean, who was Pac cousin from North Carolina, they all, we was all staying at my grandmother's house. You know what I mean? So while Pac was in prison, he wanted us close to him. So we was in Jersey staying at my grandmother's house for the whole summer. Gaddafi was with his mother, of course, you know what I mean? And we would take turns going back and forth up north to visit him. What was his mentality like when he was locked up? Because from what I understand, the cops really, I mean, not not the cops, but the COs really hated him because he was so anti-police. He had shot two white cops in the South. He had a Black Panther family. And uh, the cops, you know, the COs took it personally. From what I understand, they'd be like, oh, here goes, here comes a gangster rapper. Yeah, and I remember they, Pop, they would just m mess with him a lot. Yeah, I remember they messed him up when he said one time that they called him like a And he was shocked. He was looking at the other inmates like, what? And they was like, you know, it is what it is. What can we do? We, we, you know what I mean? We inmates. We have no rights up in here. So that messed him up when he was like, you know what I mean? How the disrespect from the COs. But um, Pac held it down. When we used to go visit him, he still was the same. He was joking. 
You know what I mean? Laughing, joking. Um, he was more focused, of course. You know, we'd come up there here, spit some of his lyrics that he was doing, you know, you know, that he was writing in there. And um, that's the first time I start seeing him like, you know, write on paper, bad boy, scratch it out. You know what I mean? I saw him changing, definitely. And 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 he had every right to do so, you know what I mean, from what he just went through. Right, because Who Shot You came out while Pac was locked up. And I remember I talked to uh to the producer of Who Shot You. Mm-hmm. You know, we were we were DMing online. I'm like, did that have anything to do with Tupac? And the producer said, absolutely nothing. It was done before the situation, everything. Yeah, but why put it out, like why rush to put it out at that particular time? It just wasn't it just wasn't a wise decision. You know what I mean? Even they try to like just to capitalize off of what Pac was going through. If it wasn't about him, it just wasn't wise to put it out at that time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and I remember when I was talking to Richie Rich, I guess Pac had uh, written him a letter and said, hey, uh, Suge Knight is talking about bailing me out and I would be joining Death Row and so forth. You know, what do you think I should do? Yeah, and Richie Rich hit him back and said, "I I don't think you should do it, man. You got the number one album. You're on Interscope and wow. so forth." Wow. And then Pac wrote him back, and in the at the, at the top of the letter, it just said, "Hey, man, this guy's getting me out of prison, and I need to get the hell up out of here. So <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm I'm going to need to do what I need to do." Facts. He had to do what he had to do. You know what I mean? Interscope just left him hanging. Interscope left him hanging, and um, a lot of people don't know that Suge was trying to get Pac on death row prior to that. Like he always wanted Pac on death row. I remember seeing an interview where Suge said that he they was all in the Interscope building, if I'm not mistaken, and Pac was with like his death row, his rated R, uh, his um thug life homies and big psych in them. And he was like, I was trying to talk to Pac then, like come to death row. And Pac was a hothead. You know, he just stormed out of the meeting. He, you know what I mean? And and Suge was like, then he wasn't ready. So he already knew that Suge was he wanted him on death row. You know what I mean? So he made that call and he had to do what he had to do. Yeah, and when he hit death row, it just took off crazy. Yeah, man. It went to another level. And it was like, um, you know, him and Suge, that combination was um, it was a deadly combination. You know, because Pac needed Pac needed somebody that can balance him out. And Suge was just like Pac. Like, so Pac say, come on, I want to go knock this dude out. Suge would be like, come on, I'm, let's do it together. Like like two kids, you know what I mean? Pac needed somebody to say, no, nah, you the little brother, you the star of the company, sit back here, let us handle the work. Okay, well, speaking of Thug Life, uh, one of the members, Rated R, actually is in prison right now uh, doing life over a murder. Yeah, unfortunately. You know what I mean? Unfortunately, he'd been locked up for, I would say, man, at least... Um, maybe 15 years or so, or maybe longer. I'm not sure. You know what I mean? But uh, I spoke to him last summer. You know what I mean? He's he's holding his head being positive. We try to bring some attention to his case because from what it seemed like it was self-defense. One of his big homies that came home from prison from his hood kept trying to put, push up on him and came to his house and he defended himself. And the dude died. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's just a lot of tragedy when you look at Pac's inner circle yeah uh you you know like for example i just had you know Edie uh, on vlad tv recently and he pointed out that he's the last living person from hit him up including the producer johnny j you are the last surviving person on that song depressing sometimes to think about that because even johnny j is gone yeah even the producer yeah and another record all about true Cause even Nate's not here no more. Yeah, bro. When I seen that, that's why I called Edie. I was like, you know, I never even looked at it like that. You know what I mean? And Johnny J, you know, a lot of people don't know I did a whole solo album with Johnny J. Like I was close with Johnny J. Like he called me one day, was like, Moo, I want to do your album. He produced my album. But then when I became Muslim, I moved to Saudi Arabia. And I kind of like, you know what? I don't want to put the album out. And next thing I know, I get a call a couple months later that, you know, they say he killed himself. They say that, you know what I mean? But God knows it, it, it was some like fishy things surrounding his death that, di- that didn't add up. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. I mean, just look at all the people that are gone. I mean, you got from the outlaws alone, uh, Gaddafi's dead. Um, Fatal. Fatal's dead. Uh, 
Big Psych, Big Psych. is dead. Yeah, it's sad. Um, you know, Rated R is doing Life in Prison. Pac is dead. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's sad, man. When you look back, sometimes I look at a picture and I, and majority of the people in that picture is gone. You know what I mean? Big Psych, Gaddafi, Fatal, Pac. You know, it's sad, definitely. Very sad. A lot of tragedy. A lot of tragedy with people that should still be here right now because none of them are that old when they passed. Yeah. Or All of them was young. You know what I mean? All of us is young. You know, um, Gaddafi, I think when he passed away, 18, 19 years old, big psych, you know, 40s, fatal, you know, 30s, you know, pot 25. Most people, you know, they get shocked when they hear that pot pass away. He was only 25 years old when he died. You know what I mean? And most people, they they surprised at that. You know, I think Pac would have changed and, and matured up and just been a different person, you know, God willing. Yeah, I mean, the body of work for a 25-year-old is just unbelievable. Yeah. He's a hard worker, bro. All right, so you apparently had a situation where you snatched Puffy's mic? Yeah, man, that was... um. It was crazy, you know what I mean? We got invited by Tretch to come to um, MTV Awards, was doing a, um, they was honoring Biggie and Pac. And at that particular time, Tretch had a song out dedicated to Pac, and Biggie had, um, and Puffy had a song dedicated um, to Biggie. And I didn't want to do it, you know what I mean? Um, of course, at that time, my manager, Steve Lobel, he was trying to really get us away from you know, our small circle and try to get us to start rubbing shoulders on another level. So he was like, I think this would be good for your career to show that y'all on stage with Puffy. And I was still in that mindset back then, like, I can't do it. You know what I mean? But the rest of the outlaws is like, we have to do it. You know what I mean? It's good for our careers. Even Big Psych was there, like, man, do it. And I was like, man, no. So after a while, I, I came up with this plan, you know, and kept it to myself. You know, I was drinking, of course, and uh, intoxicated. And I said, I'm going to wait till we live on TV and I'm going to just snatch the mic from Puffy. Like, why we live, you know what I mean? In rehearsal, I'm already, you know, drinking and drunk. So in rehearsal, I'm saying lights and flashing. And I can't differentiate between rehearsal or live television. So while he had the mic, I just still snatched it from him, you know what I mean? And um, he came and tried to grab it back. We got into a little tussle. The security came. They kicked us out. You know, so the outlaws was, you know, they was upset. Steve Lobel, Tretch was upset because he put his name on the line. Um, and Shaquem, like I said, Shaquem, that's family. So Shaquem came, you know, to our room, was like, you know, Puffy want to speak to you and you got to come alone. And I went to like this little side room. He was there with his boys. They could have they could have got me. You know what I mean? I don't even know why I done it. <laughs> so I went in the room and Puffy was there with his boys and he was like, why you do it? You know, I said, you know why I done it, man. We don't, let's not even go back and forth. You know what I mean? And um, it was one of them things, man. I was just a young wild dude that, you know, my emotions couldn't, I couldn't keep it together. And um, yeah, it happened. <laughs> Okay, so he just let you go at that point? Yeah, yeah. He, you know, it's not he could have done, like, to, you know what I mean? Like, I still have my, like, you know, everybody was with me around the corner. He was just probably trying, he was trying to figure out, I remember him saying, why did you do it? You know what I mean? And I think Big G, Big G is Edie uncle. He was the only one in there with me with Shot Kim. And I'm feeling uncomfortable because I'm looking at Shaq Kim. Shaq Kim was family, so I know he's not going to put me in a situation that's detrimental for myself, you know, detrimental. So I'm looking at Shaq Kim like, why do you bring Puffy with all his boys to security? And you tell me to come along. Good, you know, G came with me, but I'm like, you know, why you bring me back here? And Puffy was like, why did you do it? And I was like, you know why I done it. You know what I mean? We can't even, let's not. And I remember him saying something like, man, that's why I'm about to move to Europe. I'm tired of this mess. And, and then we just walked away. Never seen him again after that. <laughs> but I'm sure that's probably one of the reasons our careers didn't really go up, you know, because at that time, you know, people were still hating on us on the radio and we felt blackballed at that particular time. Well, you were there during the situation when Pac ran into Nas. Yes, I was there. I okay. was there. And apparently you brought all your Jersey guys with you, like 30 guys who all had guns on them. Yes, we was deep. We were strapped. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, and I remember... Um, we we you know i saw an interview uh that snoop did that we had on our channel that said you know snoop i guess was there also and he said that like Pac had 100 guys with guns and, and nas had 100 guys with guns and it was a very tense situation yes what snoop was saying like pretty much from what he said it, it, it wasn't accurate when he was like um 
like Nas gave Pac a pass. Like Snoop or Zach Words was like, you know, I'm from the streets, I'm a gangbanger. So I seen that if Nas wanted to, he could have, you know, rolled on Pac, which is which is which which far from the truth because like I said, I was there with Jersey, all my homies was there, um, and we were strapped. And then you had Gaddafi and Fatal Boys was there, they were strapped. And then you had the outlaws. I mean, then you had death row members there and the security there. Don't get me wrong, Nas was deep. I think if it would have went down, it probably would have been a bloodbath. It would have been an unfortunate situation. But I appreciate the way Nas and Pac handled it. You know what I mean? I think that's something that, and and that should go down in the history of hip hop, that two generals was able to show the rest of the people how to confront a situation manly, talk it out, shake hands, and move on. You know what I mean? So I think that's it was dope the way Pac and Nas handled it. Well, prior to to the Vegas incident, there was the situation when Snoop was in New York and he got on the radio and said that he has no problems with uh, Big E or Puffy or whatever, that those are his homies. But I remember in an interview you recently did, you talked about how previous to that, Snoop was in the studio with Pac dissing Biggie and Puffy. True, you know what I mean? That's why Pac, see people was making it seem like Pac was just this angry hater. You know what I mean? That he was trying to bring other members in death row to come and partake in his beef with Bad Boy, but that's not true. Pac and Snoop fell out, not just because of the, he went on Angie Martinez and said that that's my homie, because if that's how he was from the beginning, Pac would have respected that. You know what I mean? If he would have said to Pac from the beginning, like, look, man, I don't want nothing to do with this beef. They my homies. I can't get involved. Pac would have respected that. But when Snoop was in LA, he was doing songs dissing Biggie, talking bad about Biggie and Puffy. You know what I mean? Um, then go to New York. Remember that when they were shooting that video out there, Biggie got on the radio and some people came and shot at him. He went back and started doing diss track uh, records against Biggie. So Pac is the type of person, if you come straight forward and say, nah, I'm not getting involved in your beef, he's going to say, no problem. So he wasn't mad at Snoop because of that. He was just mad that he felt like when Snoop was in LA, he was riding with him against Biggie. Then when he came in New York, he said he wasn't. You know what I mean? So that Pac was hurt. Well, do you remember any of the verses that Snoop was was doing against Biggie and them? He has some verses, man. I, I don't remember offhand, but I remember hearing him like literally mentioning like, you know, Biggie's size and you know what I mean? And I remember Dead Eye. I remember him really coming at Biggie. You know what I mean? Like he was coming at Biggie, man. It wasn't like it wasn't, it wasn't definitely no secret. So that's why Pac was upset. You understand? Like Pac loved Snoop. And I'm sure Snoop loved Pac. We ain't gonna take that from him. They had a really good relationship. But Pac wasn't just mad because he got on there and said that's his homies. He was mad that you he felt like he was playing both sides. You know? Yeah, and I guess you feel some type of way because Snoop never really admitted to any of this or I, I, I said it in the you know when I kept hearing these interviews, it it seemed like Snoop kept throwing Pac under the bus, and that's the only reason I spoke about it because I was ignoring it. You know when I seen like a lot of interviews, it seemed like Snoop was just pushing Pac, like throwing Pac under the bus. It was an interview I seen that he did with Jada Pinkett, and Jada Pinkett was getting on Snoop for using a B word, and somehow he just brought Pac name up again. You know what I mean? Like, well, Pac is the one. So I just felt like as a friend, you you Pac friend, you shouldn't always bring him up in negative conversations because he's not here to defend himself. And you say you his friend. Like, let us remember him in a positive way. We already got too many um, people that's trying to, you know, highlight the negative things that Pac did. Because he, of course, he made many mistakes. He was a young guy. So as a friend, you should highlight the positive things. You know what I mean? And it seemed like he always highlighted that Pac was the one bringing him back to disrespecting women and stuff like that. So that's why I spoke about it. You know what I mean? Well, the Las Vegas incident where Tupac gets killed. Since our last interview, I sat down with Keefe D., who was the last surviving member in the car that shot Tupac's car up. Yes, yes. Did you watch that whole interview? I didn't watch the whole interview. You know what I mean? I think I checked a few minutes and I just couldn't watch it. You know what I mean? Because for me, it's like, it's difficult to watch an interview of someone who admitting that he was in the car with the people that killed a person who was like a brother to me. You know what I mean? So 
I just I couldn't do it. You know what I mean? Did you know who Keefe D or Orlando was before that situation? Not before the situation. After the situation happened, um, it was kind of like a war in Compton after that. You know what I mean? And then we start hearing like they from this hood, um, Keefe D, um, nephew was Orlando Anderson. Orlando Anderson was a, he was known to be a rider. You know what I mean? He was known to be a legit gang member. He was known to be a good a, a, a gangster. That's what it was worries on the streets. You know what I mean? But I never heard of him before that. I knew about their hood. You know what I mean? Um, because I used to go to Compton a lot with some of Suge little homies. So I kind of knew about, you know, what place to go to, what try to stay away from, but I never heard of them. You know what I mean? I knew, for example, that um, when Puffy and Biggie was coming to LA, they was hiring them for security. That's how the first time I think I started hearing about the Southsiders. Well, Keefe D lays out the whole story. What, you know, what led up to this whole situation, the night of the actual shooting, and then the aftermath yeah. of, of that particular event. Uh, you know, for anyone who thinks that there's a conspiracy that Suge had Pac killed or the government somehow had him killed, just watch that interview from beginning to end and you'll see the exact timeline that matches up with everyone else's timeline that was actually there. And from what the rumors that I had heard was that the arm that stuck out the window was not a skinny arm like Orlando's. It, it was more of a beefy, muscular arm. Yeah. You heard the same thing? I heard the same thing. You know what I mean? I heard the same thing that um, I kind of even heard that Orlando wasn't the one that, of course, somebody in that car had done it, but it wasn't him. You know what I mean? And um, like I said, man, you know, when it comes to these type of things, even if they get away from it in this life, you know what I mean? They ain't gonna get away from God. They gonna, you know what I mean? You can run, you know what I mean? You can you can try your best, you know what I mean? Cause Pac, unfortunately, you know what I mean? We know in the streets these things happen, Vlad, you know what I mean? I just wish that Pac, because he's a very intelligent person, we can't change the past. I just wish that that night he would have reacted different, you know what I mean? Because he know better. Like Pac is the type of person, like he used to teach us not to do these type of things. But unfortunately, when it's your time, it's your time. You know what I mean? What can you do? Yeah, I mean, me and Edie, we talk a lot. We're we're friends. We, totally. we live close to each other. We hang out. And and he has always described it as just a perfect storm of bad events. How just, you know, they should not have seen Orlando in the MGM. Uh, you know, that car should have never ran into Tupac's car. Like, all these things just kind of went very, very badly. Yeah. And, and it all just kind of fit together. When it's written for us to go, to, to, to go and for us to die, it, you know what I mean? It's going to happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I guess, you know, when you talk about just a, a perfect storm of bad events, yeah. if you really think about it, after a situation like that in the MGM, right, when everyone knows they just stomped out someone from the Southside Crips, which is the enemy gang yeah. of essentially death row. Yeah, true. You know, and Bob Pyru. You would think, okay, at this point, we need to get into a bulletproof car. We need to move in a stealth-like fashion. You know, we need tinted windows and so forth. But from what I understand was the day before, Suge Knight bought that BMW. Wow. I didn't even and know. And it was, it was the top of the line 7 Series BMW. So, you know, there was no X5s or X7s at that time. So you're talking about the very best car from one of the top, uh, you know, manufacturers. Yeah. So Suge probably wanted to show that off. Exactly. He, exactly. he wanted to floss in it and he had his little homie with him who was the biggest star in the world. Yeah, true. He wanted everyone to see him. He wanted the windows untinted because he had just got the car. He's got it, yeah. And because of... That, which I'm assuming is what happened, of course. You know, you get a brand new car, of course you want to ride yeah, it. Yeah, you want to floss in it, you know what I mean? And you also want to floss in it. And also from, you know, from that that a gang mentality, especially, you know, maybe Suge homies, and I don't know, I can't speak for them, but maybe they probably thought, okay, we're in Vegas. This is not LA. Maybe they don't have that many guns with them. Maybe they're not gonna try this, not too many of them. So they probably thought maybe when we go back to LA, we're gonna really have to be on point. But we in Vegas, we this this um, neutral grounds for everybody. This nobodyhood. 
So I guess you felt they felt lax. You know what I mean? I guess they felt like it couldn't happen then. And um and it did, you know what I mean? Well, yeah. I mean, in the KFD interview, we talked about how after the the MGM incident, they were hanging out with this guy Zip, who was one of Puffy's guys, and they got the gun from him. Yeah. And you know, there was the rumor that Puffy was supposed to pay like a million dollars or whatever for the hit. And just recently, I interviewed T.K. Kirkland. Mm, yeah, yeah. Do, do, do you know where I'm going with this? No, I want to hear, but T.K. Kirkland, okay. funny though, man. T.K. Kirkland yeah. was actually best friends with Eric Von Zip. Wow. They wow. were roommates. Yeah. Wow. And T.K. Kirkland confirmed that Zip got a like a half million dollar payment from Puffy. Wow, 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 wow. But but Zip kept that money. Wow, so he confirmed it pretty much that he confirmed it on tape and Zip Zip is now dead. Yeah, I already Zip, died. Zip died, Zip, Zip died of cancer. But Zip took that money and bought like a nightclub or something with it. This is crazy. And, and never and never gave it to to Keefe D in Orlando and them. Well, the story that has circulated was that after Tupac got killed, Puffy allegedly gave the money I heard. To, to Zip. Yes. And Zip was supposed to give the money to, to Keefe in there. Yes. But he never gave the money to But him. thank God he never gave him the money, right? Think about it. If he gave the money, Puffy would be in prison now, money for hire, a murder for hire. So thank God. If, if, if this is a true story. I, I'm not saying yes or no. But if he would have gave him them the money, it had been a murder for hire and Puffy would be locked up. But, you know, in a way that kind of saved Puffy because had that money been handed over, then Puffy could have potentially been up for a murder for hire. But since he yeah. just gave this dude some money and the guy kind of kept it and now he's dead, Puffy wow, can't wow, really wow. be tied into nothing. Man, that's crazy, bro. That's crazy, man. But... I wouldn't be surprised, you know what I mean? I wouldn't be surprised. Because we also heard these rumors, you know? And when you're yeah. a scary dude, uh, Vlad, like from what I knew, and I'm talking about during those days, during those times, Puffy was very intimidated of Suge, you know what I mean? So when you're a scary guy and you have money, it's easy for you to pay someone to do your dirty work, you know? Well, you know, you know, we we're just speaking about Big Psych. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about Thug Life, one of the members is actually doing life in prison for murder right now. Yeah, rated R. Rated R. Okay, you knew him? Yeah, I knew him very well. You know, I was close with Rated R. Um, he was a homie. I spoke to him in the summer. You know what I mean? I spoke to him last summer. Um, I was trying to help bring some attention to his case because I have a friend of mine who just came home. They tried to get him 55, 55 years in prison for having weed, Weldon Angelos. You know what I mean? So he just came home after doing 15 years and he get invited to the White House a lot. And he's, he, you know, he trying to help Loon. He trying to help a few other people get out of prison early. So I put him in contact with Rated R. So Rated R, you know what I mean? From what it seemed like his situation was a self-defense. One of his big homies came home from prison, tried to push up on him. And Rated R, you know, from what, from what, they say he defended himself and the guy got, you know, the guy died, you know? Well, you had a situation, uh, I guess, after Pac's death where you uh, confronted Ice Cube? Yeah, man, it was, um, <laughs> I was at a, um, there was a producer guy named One Eye and um, he was cool with me. I had a group that I was trying to put on from Jersey and he used to produce for him, but he also was producing for Cube at this time. And one day he called me to the studio and he's like, maybe you'll get on this track that I did with Cube. And um, back then, my whole mindset was like, look, Lloyd Pop comes first. I don't care about the track. You know, I forget the songs, but it seemed like Cube used to take like shots at Pop. You know what I mean? And so I forget the exact song, but I asked him in the studio. I'm like, yo, Cube, man. And that song, it seemed like you was dissing Pop, man. Was you dissing Pop? He looked shocked because he probably like, this, this guy, we invited him as a guest in the studio and he coming at me like this and he... You know, he looked shocked on his face. He's like, no, nah, I wasn't dissing Pac. He walked out the room and um, he never finished his song. You know what I mean? And I think he probably took 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And so I left. 
And like the next day, the dude one night called me. He was like, what did you say to Q, man? He was upset. <laughs> I was like, nah, I just asked him, did he, did he, you know, was dissing Pac? And he was like, man, you messed up a chance of you being on the song with Ice Cube. And then, but you know what I mean? My goal, my, back then, um, uh, Vlad, my mind frame was like, my loyalty come with Pac. Like, I'm not going to try to, you know what I mean? Now that Pac dead, you know, people taking shots at him. And just because I want to, you know, further my career, I'm just going to, you know, I just couldn't do that. You know what I mean? That's why I couldn't be on stage with Puffy at the MTV Awards. I just couldn't do those certain things. Maybe for career-wise, it probably would have been best to do those things. But back then, I couldn't do them. You know what I mean? Right. And you and Little C's actually got on the phone at one point. After he spoke with Young Noble. You know, Little C spoke with Young Noble and they got on the phone with each other and they was about, they was beefing, like barking at each other. And then they just, the conversation went to a positive tone. And, you know, they started talking like, man, after 20 some years, we still angry at each other for what? And Noble told me what happened. And he was like, man, you know, I said, give him my number. Give me his number. I want to holler at him. So I spoke to him and it was all love. You know what I mean? It was all love. We, we never met each other. You know what I mean? He was just riding for Biggie. We was riding for Pac. 20 years later, both our generals is dead. Why keep continue this ignorant stuff? Because you never know, man, if Pac was alive, he probably would have squashed the beef with Biggie. You know what I mean? I agree. I definitely agree. Because these are 20 year olds, man. 25, 23 year olds, just- Young kid, they kids, you're right. Yeah. Well, since our last interview, Suge took a 28 year plea deal. Man. When you heard that news, because, well, at one point, the outlaws were signed to death row, and, and I remember that it wasn't all that great of a situation. I remember me it and wasn't. Edie, we just talked, and he was saying how Suge had some sort of disagreement you yeah. know, with the outlaws or Interscope, and he ended up stopping the promotion of the outlaws album. Yes. So you know, were you on that album as well? Of course, yes. I was on that album. Okay. I, was, um, I was the one who went to Suge Knight personally in prison, looked him face to face, and said, I want it, we want to get off death row. You know what I mean? Because I didn't want to go behind his back while he was in prison. They just wanted to send a lawyer to him. And I was like, no, I think it's right that let's do it like men. I want to go to him face to face and say, look, release us. And he said, okay. He was in prison at this time. He's like, no problem. Y'all don't want to be on. You know, I ain't withholding nobody that don't want to be down. Okay, I'll let y'all go. But he never released us. Two months, three months, six months. So then we had to sue him. Um, it wasn't no money of all. We just had to sue to get released from death row. So I guess at that time he was a little, he was upset. Like he he spent money on the out the outlaw album. You know, he put us in when we first went back to LA, we got kicked out of pretty much every hotel you can think of in LA. And he kept paying, like, you know what I mean? And then he put us in a house in the valley. We destroyed this house and he kept paying. So I guess when we got off of death row, and he said it, like he felt like we own. You know what I mean? He felt like we own. And I told him another time that I was able to face him when when he came home and, you know, me and Shug cool now, but when he first came home from jail, there was some fiction. So he ran into Edie and he was like, yeah, y'all owe me money. And I remember Edie called me and I said, what did you say? Edie's like, I just ignored him. And I was like, nah, Edie, man, you can't ignore a person like that. You supposed to, where he at? And that's when I called Bone, you know what I mean? And I called Bone and I called like my cousins and my brothers. I'm like, Sugar's at this studio, let's go up there. And we strapped up and we all got strapped and we went up there and we confronted them. And I was like, Suge, can, let me holler at you. And we sat down, you know what I mean? And my homie Quinn, Reeve, Rod, all of us, not Roddy, my brothers, Bone was there. And I said, Suge, I heard you say we owe you money. Because I'm the type of dude, Vlad, I'm not a big gangster. I'm not none of that, but I'm the type of person, I know street politics. You know what I mean? I know, and I know Suge, you know what I mean? And I see how Suge move. If he say you own money and you don't confront it, then you own money. You just gonna have to pay him. You know what I mean? So I said, no, I'm gonna try to nip this in the butt now. So I went there in the studio, we sat down with Suge, and he was like, yeah, you owe me money. And I was like, I don't feel like I owe you nothing. You know what I mean? I was straight up with him. And I think that's why he always had a lot of respect for me because I always was honest with him and straight up. And he was like, okay, I'm just going to get it from Interscope, from, you know, from, from the white man. That's what he said. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then after that, our relationship just grew. It got better and better. You know what I mean? Because we pock homies, he pock homie. What's the reason to keep crashing, you know, clashing? You know what I mean? Well, when you heard about his 28-year plea deal, what'd you think? I felt sorry for him. I felt sorry for him because he, he had an empire. You know what I mean? He had an empire and it was sad that, you know, he went from the top to the bottom and that 
that way, that style. You know what I mean? Um, Bone is a close friend of mine, of course. So, you know what I mean? I was upset what happened with Bone. And Suge is also, we became friends. We grew to have mutual respect. It just was a sad situation. You know, I, we don't wish that on nobody. You know, 28 years in prison. After, it's just sad, man. Like Suge, like Pac, he should have had people around him. Like, I think Death Row was worth $500 million. He's supposed to have people around him saying, nah, you can't act like this, man. You know what I mean? Like, how you gonna behave like this when you come to this level? And you can't behave like that when you could when you you gotta know how to adapt, you know what I mean? And unfortunately, he didn't want to adapt. And the people that he was running around scaring, they will get you eventually. You know what I mean? They was waiting for a reason. And he brung it to him, he brung it on himself, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, you can't bully the whole world. Nah, nah. You just can't. You could bully who you think you could bully, but once you start dealing with people with money, these people are gangsters in their own way. In a whole nother way. They you gangsters know? where they put you yeah. in a cell. You know what I mean? And you can't do nothing. So, And it's just the mindset, man, that when you really come from a hood and you make it, you try to yeah, you try to change. Like You don't want to run around and look for trouble. You, that's the last thing you want because you say, look where I come from. Look how far I came. Why would I, you know what I mean, jeopardize this? To try to act like a gangster, it's just sad that that happened to him that way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you have, well, number one, you live in Saudi Arabia and you have your own coffee shop. Yes, yes. MW Cafe. <laughs> yep. Yep. So congratulations on that. And you got a book coming out. I got a book coming out. It's uh, um written by a friend of mine, Suleiman Jenkins. He from Brooklyn. You know what I mean? So that's dope. He from Brooklyn, New York. Been living in Saudi for 20 years. He's an amazing writer. He's an educator. You know what I mean? His ac on the academic level, he was able to take my book that it doesn't matter if you're from the hood, you Muslim, you Christian, you black, you white, you street, you, you not street. The way he wrote the book, the style, everybody would be able to relate to it. You know what I mean? And believe it or not, Vlad, man, I know probably every rapper says this, but my life is crazy. Like, you know what I mean? And when I read it, even reading back, I'm like, I thank God that I was able to survive this. You know what I mean? Like it, it, it's 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 stuff that you know. Grown men after we gave the book to a few grown men, they broke down crying. You know what I mean? And this and he wrote it in a way where it's not you know it, it's not where most rappers when they write books they want to just portray how hard they is and you know what I mean. But he did it in, on an academic level that's amazing. That I think we God willing it's going to go you know it can benefit be beneficial for the people. You know what I mean? I'm gonna oh, send yeah, you a no, copy, I... man. You tell me what you think. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, I, want, I definitely want a coffee. Definitely. Uh, and you know, when you and I first started sitting down, and you told me the story of your parents, uh, I mean, I I started to cry myself. It's just yeah, I remember a, definitely, definitely something that no child should ever experience. Definitely, um, man. And that's just one know, part. And, and, you know what I mean? That's just like after the death of my parents, it just it it didn't get easy. You know, my brother, my brother was a big. He he became the he was the man on the block. You know what I mean? My brother became the one that everybody had to buy work from. He be, And so the same dudes that we grew up with, who we thought was our relatives and friends, they end up trying to kill my brother. You know what I mean? So similar, what happened to my mother father almost happened to my brother while he was in the house with his wife and his kid. So my whole life, it just been drama. And then I, I meet up with Pac and then he, the situation, and then Gaddafi. And then, you know what I mean? I didn't really feel no peace and, and, and a normal life until I became Muslim, you know? Yeah, and here you are living in Saudi Arabia with your family, your kids. Uh, there's no violence. There's no crime. There's no drama. You're running a legitimate coffee business. Definitely. Uh, yeah, man. Congratulations on turning Thanks. everything around because Thank you. statistically, you should not be here right now. Yeah, true, true. Thank God. You know what I mean? Thank God. Definitely. Yeah. Well, Muto, man, until next time. Appreciate you, Vlad. It's always a pleasure, no bro. No doubt. All right. Peace. All right. Peace.